The Blizzard Stone, by Stephen Lake. Captain. Sails, came the cry from across the deck. Jack Spareleg, captain of the pirate galleon Molly's Revenge looked up from his place on the fantail of his ship and saw the young boy, his lookout in the crow's nest, pointing off to the east. Curious, he looked that way, but saw nothing. So he raised his telescope and scanned the shoreline. Suddenly, as though sailing through the very island itself, the art ego appeared, her sails full of wind as she sliced effortlessly through the water. Jack lowered his telescope and looked off towards the art ego in interest. His first mate soon stepped up to his side, took his own telescope, and looked off in the same direction. After a few moments he lowered the telescope before looking back at his captain. Should I weigh anchor, sir, and set full sail? We don't want them to escape us laden with all of the Pirate King's gold, he said. However, to his surprise, Jack waved for him to stop. Our efforts to take their ship will be of no benefit to us, said Jack. The first mate looked at him in confusion. How so, sir, she is the only ship thus far to survive the Cape, the hiding place of the Pirate King's vast treasure, he replied. But Jack shook his head. They sail too lightly to have taken even a single shilling of gold. No, it is clear to me that they have only acquired a bit of knowledge, and not the actual treasure, he said. Knowledge, sir, asked the first mate. Jack frowned slightly. The pirate king was far too wise of a man to simply hide his treasure in a place where anyone could find it, and make off with its vast bounty. If I were him, I would have hid it in a way that no mere scallywag could steal the mountains of gold that I had collected. No, I would have merely left a clue, but no gold of any kind, he replied. The first mate pondered this. Is such the reason why you have chosen not to partake of the Pirate King's first challenge, but rather to wait here instead in hopes of finding another, much safer means by which to gain this first clue to the whereabouts of the Pirate King's treasure? He asked. Indeed I have, for which I am most grateful, said Jack. The first mate thought about this briefly, and then cocked his head slightly. So how shall we acquire this first clue, now that we know where to find it, he asked. Jack grinned slyly. That will be quite easy, actually. Now that we know that there is a hidden entrance on the backside of the cape, we only need to enter through there, and we can take, for free, what others have given their lives to capture. Now, raise sail, and set course for the east of the cape. However, keep your distance, and only explore it from afar, as I do not believe that the pirate king would have left the exit to this challenge unguarded as even a fool is lucky enough at times to overcome even the best of hidden doors. I, Captain, replied the first mate. The Molly's revenge then raised sail, struck anchor, and made for the exit of the cape. As they closed on it, still well beyond its beautiful, crystal-blue waters, Jack took notice of a place along the shore that was filled with trees. But he wasn't interested in it because of the greenery that dotted its picturesque and sandy shoals. What caught his interest was the strange carpet of casks, planks, and other debris that seemed to appear from nowhere and float out into the sea. Whatever was there, it was hidden from view, and thus too risky to approach by ship. So he turned to his first mate, and said, Prepare the long boats. We will send men ashore to find what it is that we search for. But be sure that, no matter what they find, they take nothing, nor harm anything, as we may, as yet need to return here at some point to scour this land again, and thus we should not risk erasing any clues that we find. Aye, Captain, replied the first mate. The crew soon lowered a longboat into the sea, with six crewmen aboard, who then quickly made their way towards the shore. However, as they approached it, Jack and his crew watched in shock and horror as the sea seemed to rise up and consume their boat, dragging it, and all six men, below the waves. So they sent out a second boat, which suffered the same fate. Jack was both appalled, and intrigued by this. It would seem that the Pirate King was wiser than any of us realized. Even the land itself, and the sea, are built to keep out those who refuse to partake in his trials, he said quietly to himself. He then turned to his first mate, and said, Call the other ships together. We need to discuss what our plans will be to overcome this challenge. I, Captain, replied the first mate. He then turned to the ship's signal man, and ordered him to relay the message. 
Within twenty minutes, all nine of Jack's ships had gathered together, and weighed anchor in a tight, easily traveled raft of ships. And, while the ships clearly did not like being tied together as they were, given how the waves of the sea tossed them about, it worked for what they needed. Eventually the nine captains decided to send men to a seemingly clear and unencumbered stretch of beach some distance from the exit of the Cape. To everyone's great relief, they were able to land safely. However, as they walked down the beach, and drew close to the exit, they came across traps that they didn't expect, which killed several of them, and hindered their progress. Jack marveled at this. Clearly the pirate king had thought of everything. This is exactly why he was king, and not someone else. The men on the beach, despite the hindrances, and the danger, continued trying to get close to the exit from the cape, but repeatedly failed to do so. It was during this time that they discovered that one of the young lads with them, a cabin boy by rank, could see the traps that were blocking them, whereas the other men could not. So, using his small size, and his ability to detect the traps, they were able to penetrate the defenses around the exit from the cape, and enter the small bay that held the little stone house that Brenton, and the crew of the Art Ego, had already found. Having been instructed by their captains to not harm or touch anything inside, as only clues would be found there, and not gold, the men diligently, but cautiously searched the entire shoreline of the bay, and recorded in detail everything they found. This included drawings, and detailed notes that were created by the young cabin boy. Then, having finished their investigation, they all returned to their long boats, using the young cabin boy's skills to guide them, and made for their ships. Once there they took what they discovered and gave it to Jack. But, what was presented to him did not leave the salty old pirate captain feeling as though he had gained anything beneficial from the effort. If anything, he felt just as defeated as Brenton had been when he'd first seen the little stone house. Eventually he dismissed his men, and then returned to his cabin to contemplate this. There had to be a clue here, as the pirate king would not build such a complex series of traps, and trials just to protect nothing. Jack soon sat down at his map table, in his cabin at the back of the ship, poured himself a glass of rum, and then began to read everything that his men had brought back with them. He knew that the pirate king was no fool. So, whatever he had done to this place, especially given all the traps that were laid for anyone daring to breach its sacred beaches, it meant that something important was hidden inside. He just had to figure out what. He quietly studied the papers on his map table for hours, mulling over each one of them in his mind as he tried to understand what the clue was that the pirate king had left behind. Suddenly, as though a light had gone on in his head, he came to a realization of what he was seeing. The answers he was seeking had been there the entire time. It just took a very wise mind to see past the thick veil of deception that had been placed over them. He then tossed down the papers, raced out of his cabin, and looked up at the helmsman. Helm, set course for Boulder House, best possible speed. He shouted. The other men looked at him in confusion, uncertain what to make of this strange and confusing outburst by their captain. Sir, asked the first mate in confusion. Boulder House. That's what the stone house in the bay at the end of the challenge was pointing to. Somewhere in that village is the next clue in our search for the Pirate King's treasure, shouted Jack excitedly. The others pondered this deeply for several moments, and then began to understand what their captain was suggesting. Their eyes soon lit up with excitement. Aye, sir. We'll get right on it, shouted the first mate. The Art Ego slowly drifted into dock, along the shoreline of the village of Boulder House, and then tied off. But, as they did, the villagers looked at Brenton, and his privateer crew, and became nervous at their mere presence. Do you come to rob us, dear sir, or are you here for other reasons? asked the dockmaster. Brenton stepped down the ramp from his ship, and onto the dock, as he gestured reassuringly to the villagers gathered there. We do not come to take what is your own. We're merely here in search of supplies, and a clue that is part of a quest we are on. To prove so, we will pay for all the provisions that we take from you today, as we will not act this day to your harm, but rather your benefit, said Brenton. This surprised the villagers. Usually when pirates and privateers came there, they looted the village, and took from them everything that could be carried away. As such, 
Brenton, and the Art Ego, were a breath of fresh air. Very well, sir we will speak with your bosun as soon as he is able, and provide you with everything you need, and at a fair price, even, said the dockmaster. Brenton bowed slightly. Thank you. We greatly appreciate your willingness to aid us, he said. And we also appreciate that you are not looting us, what with you being a privateer and all, winked the dockmaster. Brenton chuckled. Such is indeed fair, he replied. He then turned to his first mate, and said, Come, let's begin our search for the clue that we came here to find. I, Captain, said the first mate. Brenton and his men then made their way off the dock and into the adjoining village. As they walked, they could see the look of concern on the faces of the citizens around them. Privateer or not, they looked every bit like pirates to the people who were there. And, even though they weren't raping, pillaging, and plundering like pirates typically would, the people were still cautious of him and his crew. Brenton and his men soon made their way out of the little village and over to a lighthouse that sat perched on a hill that overlooked the sea. However, as they approached it, they were surprised to find it locked, and a sign posted on the door that read, This lighthouse is now fully automated, and no longer manned. Brenton and the others found this curious. What do we do, Captain? asked the first mate. Just then a man came around the side of the lighthouse and was surprised to see the small band of sailors standing in front of him. Do you be pirates? He asked. Brenton shook his head. We're not, good sir. We're explorers who have come to study your lighthouse, he replied. That was a clear and obvious lie. However, for him right now, finding the clue they'd come for was more important than who they really were. The groundskeeper studied them for several moments, before shaking his head. Strange explorers ye be, indeed. Why, ye look like pirates to me. But, who am I to judge? Is there something that I can help ye with? he asked. We were hoping to find the lightkeeper, said Brenton. Aye, that be me. Although, I am more a gardener now than a keeper, replied the man. Brenton glanced briefly at the door, and then back at the man. The sign on the door says that your lighthouse is no longer manned. How can that be? We have never heard of such a thing, he said. The keeper grinned. Aye, she now be entirely a piece of clockwork. Just raise the weights but once a week, and top off the oil, and she be doing all the rest. She is indeed a marvel of technology, he replied. Brenton and his men found this intriguing. So then there's nothing you need to do any more with this lighthouse, he asked. Nay, only what I have stated, and nothing more, replied the keeper. Fascinating. Indeed, grinned the keeper. Is there anything else I can do for thee? Brenton turned and gazed at his men, at which point they began a deep conversation, not with words, but merely with their eyes. They soon came to the agreement to not tell the keeper the true purpose of them being there. Brenton soon turned back to the keeper. At this time, there is not. We merely wish to look around your grounds, and satisfy our desire to see its beauty and majesty, he said. Aye, that ye may do. Just don't touch anything, as I would not wish for ye to break anything that I must then repair, said the keeper. Brenton tipped his hat to the keeper, and then motioned for his men to spread out and begin their search of the area. After nearly twenty minutes of seemingly fruitless searching, one of the men spotted something and then called out to the others. Boy, Captain! I found something, he shouted. Brenton and the others all rushed over to his side, and were surprised to find a large, almost pink slab of rock laying partially buried in the dirt. It didn't take Brenton long to realize what they had just found. This is the blizzard stone, he said. The what, sir? asked one of the men. The blizzard stone. There's a legend that says, if one can find the blizzard stone, it will lead them to great treasure, the likes of which none have ever seen. The first mate soon knelt down in front of the stone, and brushed aside some of the dirt, and plants that were partially covering it. Captain, there's some writing on it, inscribed directly into the stone, he said. What does it say? asked Brenton. The first mate scratched his head. I'm not quite sure what to make of it, Captain. It reads, East is West, and South is North. To lands far gone shall you go forth. 
where dragons lived, and fire burned. The waves are torn and the winds are turned. What do you think it means, he said. Brenton gently massaged his chin as he pondered the words on the stone. It sounds like a puzzle, if you ask me, said one of the men. Indeed it does, replied Brenton. They all then stood and quietly pondered the words that were written on the stone. Brenton, upon taking a closer look at the stone, soon realized that the top of it was angled, almost as though it was the needle on a compass. Even more intriguing was that it pointed due east. Just then his mind began to unravel the mystery of the rock, causing his eyes to grow wide. The others soon noticed this and perked up excitedly. Have you solved it, Captain? asked one of them. Brenton again massaged his chin thoughtfully. East is west, and south is north. That seems to indicate that we're to go in the opposite direction of where we are pointed. And, if you look at the stone, it's pointing east. Turn that around, and we are to go west. However, it also says that south is north. So, if something is directing us to go south, then we need to go north, he said. Or, perhaps northwest, said one of the men. Brenton looked at him curiously. What do you mean, he asked. The text says that we are to go to lands far gone, where dragons lived, and fire burned. That sounds like a volcanic island, and there is one, albeit a dead one, thankfully, that is to the northeast of here, replied the man. Aye, but it says that the waves are torn, and the winds are turned, said the first mate. Indeed it does. But volcanic islands tend to have rough shores where waves are often broken up and cast about as they crash upon the beach. There's also the fact that the mountain itself diverts air merely by its massive size. So, in a sense, it turns the wind, replied Brenton. That does seem to fit with that island, sir, said the man. Indeed it does. All right, everyone, back to the ship, said Brenton. Aye, Captain, came the combined replies. The men all then made their way back to the dock where they found that the crew had just finished loading the last of the supplies they'd purchased, and were ready to set sail. They then quickly made their way back out into the ocean, sailed around the island, and then out into the wider ocean on course for their next destination. Several hours later their rival, Jack Spareleg, of the Molly's Revenge, and his fleet, arrived just off the shoreline of the village of Boulder House, on the heels of the Artego's departure. Upon seeing this, the residents all began to quake in fear knowing that, without question, they were about to be plundered by pirates. However, as they watched, their fear soon turned into confusion as the Molly's Revenge pulled into their docks alone, and without any assistance from any of the other ships of Jack's fleet. It then disgorged its captain, the first mate, and the boatswain's mate. The three men soon made their way up to the lighthouse, looked around for a time, and then reboard their ship without causing even a single bit of mischief. Soon after this they pushed away from the dock, turned, and sailed to the east, having done nothing to the village, nor harmed it in any way. The villagers all looked at each other in confusion, uncertain of what to make of this. Have pirates become polite and behaved of late? asked one of them. Nay, I think they're acting as they are because they have a treasure that they seek which is far greater than anything that we can offer them. Thus, we are ignored for now until that treasure is found, and their coffers filled, said the dockmaster. One of the villagers grunted in disbelief. Ha, huh, polite pirates. Will miracles never cease, he replied. The End <laughs>